last week um, began a look at what God's Spirit is doing in us. It, it followed a uh, teaching, what is Jesus doing now? And we looked at what has become our verse of the month for April, Romans 8.34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? You know, we looked at there can be no charge or condemnation against us which sticks. When the devil throws them at us against, you know, to the Father, Jesus is sitting there at the right hand of the Father continually saying, this one's mine. That's amazing. This one's mine. And it is a huge and incredible truth. And when you feel like no one's on your side, when you feel like no one can see any good in you when you feel like whatever. Remember that it is Jesus who is at the right hand of the Father continually bringing your name before the Father saying, this one's mine. This one's mine. It's pretty awesome when we think about it. We talked a little bit about being careful you know, last week about what we continue to fix our mind and thoughts on. And I know when things are really hard in our life, it is very hard to not dwell either things personally in our life or in the lives of people we love or in the news on the world. It is very hard to not let that be the dominant thing that we feed. But we have to feed our faith. The Bible says to meditate, fix our minds upon, continually dwell on the things that are lovely, pure, praiseworthy, noble, excellence, and virtue. That's Paul, Philippians chapter 4. Shortly after the verses that say, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding of peace possible, even when situations don't change, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know, I, I was thinking about, um, I remember, I don't know why this sticks in my mind, but my science, one of my science classes in high school we did this scientific experiment, you know, as he was teaching us the scientific method, but it was to which paper towels on the market had the best value. So you look at square footage and then you would see how much it took to absorb a certain amount of spill on each one and do the math and all this and I don't know what we came up with. But what was the goal? The goal of paper towel was to just absorb what you placed it in. You know, that's what we do with the sponge. We want it to soak up. That's what we do when, like, you know, I said before, we put meat in a marinade or whatever. What are you soaking up? What, what's, what are you just dwelling in and holding on to? And we just have to be so, so careful because that is going to penetrate to our heart and our mind and it will begin to guide our thoughts. And that is why it is so important to continue to just reflect on the love of God shown to us through Christ Jesus hung on a cross. Uh, to look at his greatness. To look at his promises. We spent months looking at his promises and just why we can have a biblical hope instead of the world's, well, I hope so, but rather the things he has promised, we can know so, because it is God who has promised, and God doesn't lie. As we looked at, you know, what Jesus is doing, and we rolled into the Holy Spirit, uh, we said, first of all, the Holy Spirit is not an it. It's not a mysterious power. It's not some tool. He is God's life, his spirit within us. Um, it is something that we've talked to, he can be grieved, he can be quenched, and it does not have personality, and it cannot be grieved. Uh, it's, he is God, and, and I think we have to be careful because there's so much mystery about the Holy Spirit, and people have so many experiences and stuff that we run from the idea of the Holy Spirit, or we chase the Holy Spirit and signs and wonders at the expense of our relationship with Jesus, which has to be first. It, 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 the Holy Spirit is God dwelling in you. He is the Spirit of Christ. He is His presence. He is your life. That is what takes us from death to life, is His life coming to dwell in us through our faith. And 
And in that simplistic sense, there's no mystery to that. It, and so if we can look, what, what is God doing in me right now, through me, for me, you know, on my behalf, on others' behalf, through me. Um, and so these are things that we want to be, you know, careful about. We looked at different ways we might grieve the Father or quench the Spirit. We looked at how Jesus had promised the Holy Spirit as he prepared his disciples for his departure. He said, I will send the Father, as the Father will send you a helper who will be to your advantage. You're not going to be left alone, but rather the Holy Spirit will come to dwell in you and give you life and lead you into all truth. He, we had the outpouring of Pentecost of the Holy Spirit settling down, and we saw that was a fulfillment of a prophecy spoken by Joel some six to 900 years before Christ. And Peter said, this is what's happening at Pentecost. But this is, this is the people aren't drunk. They may be acting pretty crazy and giddy, happy, and off their rockers, but why? It's because they just got filled, they overflowed with God's presence, the God of joy, the God of peace. And they just came, you know, life just flowed over and through them. Um, I said last week, I am not a cessationist. I do not believe that the workings of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit ended at the end of the publishing of the Bible or the last apostle. I believe God is alive and well today, doing miracles, signs, wonders, healings, words of knowledge, speaking into people's lives. Um, that being said, again, you're going to hear a lot of caution in me because excesses in some places have caused us to really get scared of the Holy Spirit or so. With that being said, one of the primary jobs of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus and to remind people Jesus is who this is about. And so as we seek God's movement in our heart, his Spirit's life through us, remember it is always about a relationship with Jesus. And that's something just to keep reminding each other. Um, it's the Holy Spirit within us is incredible um, that, that God, Jesus would say it's to our advantage and that he would be our helper. I mean, that's, that's God saying, hey, I'm here to help you. And that's what's going on. Um, I was talking with Rich and Carolyn after church last week, and we talked about how, you know, the way we use the word spirit is kind of the essence of something. You know, uh, I've talked to you about that example, the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. What is the, the spirit? What's the essence of the law? And, you know, the example I use is the one given to me when I took the uh, police classes up in Hartnell. And the instructor said, okay, here's the difference. And he said, during the hippie days, you know, there was a law passed that no one could sleep along the side of Highway 1. That law was passed to give the sheriffs a legal basis to move the hippies along and keep them. They said, you're at 2 in the morning patrolling. There's a car there. You pull over. It's an elderly couple in their 90s asleep at the, you know, in the car. You tap on the window. Hey, what's going on? I'm so sorry. I was so tired. I was afraid I was going to crash. What do you do? You go, you know what? You lock your doors. I'll check on you. Every time I come by, you sleep till you're safe. That's the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law says, I'm so sorry. You need to move on. The essence God, but, but it's, the Holy Spirit is not simply the essence of God because he has personality, he is real, he is a person, but because he is God, everything that is the essence of God, the peace, the love, the joy, the self-control, the kindness, is in him, which means it is now in us. You know, Jesus said, my peace I leave to you, my joy I want you to have. It's not some external thing that's going to settle on us like a, a, you know, it's his is already within us. We need to connect and release what's already within us. And, and then we just talked about, um, you know, that it is the spirit that gives us life. So we have, like, moving on, the Holy Spirit came down, you know, after Jesus rose. He came upon the disciples. He poured out over them. Did they already have the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? Um, there's different opinions. I'm, this is opening a can of worms that divides denominations when you begin to talk about a baptism of the Holy Spirit versus the indwelling of the Holy Spirit versus all of that. I have a fairly simple 
approach to it. It's kind of like, you know, people get all divided. Can Christians have a demon in them or just, you know, I'm kind of like in them, on them, it's still there. Let's just get rid of it because it's not good. You know, I don't know the technical. I've heard so many arguments on both sides. I, that, you know, there's no way a demon could dwell within a Christian, but then I've known people who, I said, I've absolutely cast demons from Christians. Well, was it on them or was it in them? I don't know, but it's gone, so this is good. And, you know, my, my thoughts about the Holy Spirit are a little bit similar. John 20, verses 19 to 22. So the resurrected Jesus appears. This is pre-Pentecost. He's still on earth. He hasn't ascended. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw that. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So these were the disciples. Jesus meets them. He says, I'm going to be sending you out. Breathe upon them. Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, some people think that was like a preparation for Pentecost. Here's probably, and I, I could very much be wrong on this. I personally believe this was probably the moment they were born again, the moment they received God's life and went from death to life. But then he said, wait until you receive power from on high then you'll go out and be my witnesses. And I believe that was a subsequent outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you might call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, but this is important because I believe the Holy Spirit, and we will talk about this in subsequent Sundays, but the Bible is clear. The Holy Spirit is our seal as God's children. His presence in us is our seal and guarantee that we are God's children. And nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is found in Christ Jesus. I believe the Holy Spirit is what takes you and I from death to life. When we, in faith, trust in Christ, our zombie bodies that were walking dead because we were cut off from the life of God, get indwelt by the life of God, the Holy Spirit, our spirit and his become joined, and we become alive. We become new creations, born again of the Holy Spirit, born from above, as Jesus talked to Nicodemus about. That being said, we can quench, we can grieve, but there are biblical, multiple biblical examples of the Holy Spirit coming upon disciples who already had the Holy Spirit. We see that in Acts chapter 4. We'll cover that in future teachings, but you can read that. You had the, the disciples, they were threatened, they prayed, Lord, give us boldness, and said the Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them. They were filled with boldness, and God did signs and wonders. We see multiple instances of this. And we have verses like, um, I'm going, I don't have in my notes, this is kind of coming to me off the top of my head, but where two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be in their midst. Well, wait a minute, do I not have the Holy Spirit if I'm alone? Well, no, of course I do. So what does that mean? I think when believers gather, I think when we cry out for his anointing and presence, I think there's a sense that the Holy Spirit also settles upon us in a magnified presence, in a magnified way. I think it happens when we gather to worship and study his teachings. Uh, we'll see in the patterns of the early church, the Holy Spirit was continually settling on them as they loved one another, as they held things in common, as they gathered. And, and so I think that while we each have his life in us, which is what gives us life, he leads us in the truth, he speaks to us in our quiet times, he guides us, I believe there's also subsequent comings upon us that the Holy Spirit can do and increase power and anointing, giftings, equips us to do the work of God, he gives us gifts of the Spirit and magnifies. Now, denominations divide, do you... Do you can the baptism of the Holy Spirit happen at the same time as conversion? I believe it absolutely can. Can it happen later? I believe it actually can happen multiple times. By their technical word, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, no. But can the Holy Spirit come upon us over and over and fill us and anoint and empower and stuff? Yes, I absolutely believe he can. And I believe that is what we desire. My guess is that 
if not all of us, almost all of us in this room are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, believing children of God. But do we desperately need the Holy Spirit to settle with some more power, to see anointings, to see miracles, to see workings, to... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, that being said, shepherding his presence, that Jesus always remains at the center of our heart and our joy. Um, so I do believe that the disciples were born again and received the Spirit at this time. And at Pentecost came the power to be the witnesses for God. I believe that was the anointing because Jesus said to them, wait until you receive power from on high. And I believe that is what happened. And I believe that we see it again in Acts 4. That we might see it before that. We see after. And we just see the Spirit working and moving in those who did not quench and grieve, but rather embraced, encouraged, sought the presence of God and the movement of God, who surrendered themselves fully that he might fully be in them and move through them to do the work he's called us to do. Um, the Holy Spirit is, in fact, so what, what is he doing then? First of all, he is the proof of our salvation. Uh, of our being born again, new creations. Romans 8, 15 to 17. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order we may also be glorified with him. So the Holy Spirit comes into us, sets us free. We are free from the spirit, the law. We are free from death. We are made alive with God. The Holy Spirit in us cries out, Abba, the most endearing term for a father you could have in that language is my understanding. And he bears witness with our spirit. He witnesses when the devil whispers, are you even a Christian? Are you even saved? Could you even, the Holy Spirit says, yes, because I'm in you when we still feel kindness towards an enemy, when we still feel a desire to do that's right, when we still feel these things, it is the Spirit bearing witness to us. What are we of? We are children of God. If children, then heirs, fellow heirs with Christ. We are inheritors of God's riches for eternity. Not for just this brief moment called life on earth, but forever. Uh, Galatians 4, 4 to 7. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, uh, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of the son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son of a son and an heir through God. What is really cool, look at Mark 14, 36. Look what Jesus calls the father. Jesus said, Abba, Father, remove, all things are possible for you, remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And there's a verse for what we talked about earlier today during prayer requests. Jesus did not want to face what he had to face. He did not want to endure what he had to endure. And he said, God, if there's any way, remove this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. If this is the path that you need me to walk, then Give me strength to walk it. Abba, Father. Do you realize when God's life comes to dwell in you, when the Spirit of God comes to dwell in you, you are empowered because you are now a child of God to call to your Father in heaven the same way Jesus does, with the same endearing affection. Abba, Father. There's no special love word reserved for Jesus. You get to use the same word to the Father that he does. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 tells us, it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. This is huge. Uh, I talked with the youth, I gave a very abbreviated on uh, Thursday night to the youth group about this same topic. Um, it's the seal, like what would a king do to make a letter to see if you guys are as good as the youth? So if a king wanted to prove a letter being sent was from him, what would he do? Seal it with his ring. Yeah. yeah. 
he put the wax on where it was folded over and put his ring and seal it. You are the seal. The Holy Spirit is the seal that you are Christ's. His very presence in you is the seal of your authenticity. Because the Holy Spirit cannot dwell on one who has not been cleansed and made righteous by the blood of Jesus. He is the Holy Spirit. But rather the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells within you is the seal of your authenticity as God's child. And it is your guarantee. Because if the Holy Spirit is in you, that means you are receiving your eternal inheritance, eternity with the Father. Wow. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 tells us, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire <coughs> possession of it to the praise of his glory. So he is the guarantee of our eternal inheritance. Because you have it, you know you have eternity with God because you have him. But this is really neat. Um, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwelling in you is what sealed you for salvation. And this reminds me of something that, so if you think back, you know, go to your early pages of the Bible, your early chapters of Genesis, and we have Noah's flood, which was a judgment against sin. It covered and judged the entire world, and all unrighteousness was wiped out. But God came to the righteous man Noah, and he said, he didn't say by faith, it's implied, you have to trust me, basically God would say. This is what's coming. Build an ark. And this ark probably took 80 to 120 years for Noah to build. You know, with and hired probably crews and everything else, I would assume, but this is 450 feet long. This isn't your little nativity thing that you hang above your crib, you know, with the little stuff with the giraffe head four times bigger than the boat. 450 feet long. I think the battleship Missouri is only like almost 900. Okay, this is huge. Noah had to build the Ark of Salvation by faith. He had to enter it by faith. But God provided an ark of salvation. And it says in the Bible in Genesis that after Noah and his family entered, God shut the door and sealed them in. He sealed them in the ark of salvation. Jesus Christ comes to earth as our ark of salvation. He says, you enter into me by faith. And when you do, my Holy Spirit comes and seals you in. God seals us in. And that is why our eternity with God is secure. Because it is God who shut the door and sealed it. You can trust completely in your salvation in Christ because it is based on the work of God. And I just think that's a beautiful, beautiful picture. The Holy Spirit is, this, it to me, I alluded to this a moment ago, but to me the Holy Spirit is the evidence of the completeness of God's work in our life. Um, you know, as I said, he is the Holy Spirit. Uh, after Paul was writing to the Corinthians and he was telling them to flee sexual immorality and all these things, he wrote 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now obviously what he's trying to tell them is quit the sexual immorality, quit all that stuff, dude. Your body that you are just using so casually, you know, you're using outside of marriage, you're using all of this, that is that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You were bought with the blood of Christ. Do you not know that? Use your body accordingly. But this is amazing. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But the temple of the Old Testament was the most holy place. They, they couldn't even bring anything into it that hadn't been sanctified and purified and set apart for holy purposes. I mean, the priests even would enter trembling for fear of death because the holy presence of God dwelled there. But he says to you, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. How complete is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross on your behalf? 
so complete who he who is holy in whom there is no darkness can now dwell freely in you. Wow. That's pretty amazing and that should be a huge comfort. Because it does not depend upon your work but rather upon his. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. He's preparing the disciples. He's hours away from arrest. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And then John 6, 14, 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. This is huge. And this is why we must understand what God's life in us is doing. And how we encourage his presence to be <coughs> magnified, how we yield to it. Because Jesus said, more advantageous than me walking beside you is the Holy Spirit, my life within you. And he will be your helper. I don't know about you. I need so much help. Let me set that. Oh, I got three minutes? We're good. All right. I'll edit that part out. <laughs> so. Wow, right? Here's what I want to close with. This is exciting to embrace his presence and to seek to move in it is huge. We've seen it happen. We need him because the enemy is afoot. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And we need to remember that and stand upon it. But here's my cry to you. Just as Marianne and I did not get married because of the benefits it would bring. I did not get married to her so I would have a cook and a laundry person, though she is an amazing cook. Um, we got married because we love each other. And all the benefits of that are secondary. Please, let's not forget the same thing as the Holy Spirit begins to move in our midst. Let us not chase the signs more than we chase him. He is what this is all about. And in fact, it is the job of the Holy Spirit to glorify and point to Jesus. And if we ever miss that, we've missed truly what it's all about. As God moves in our heart, let us remember that it is God who moves in our heart. Let us worship him and love him and honor him and keep each other remembering him. Remember what are signs wonders. They're signs. They point to something. They point to Jesus. And may we always remember that and encourage each other to stay in step with that. So worship team, you want to come on up? After they're done, Mike will close us in prayer. And God bless you. My same encouragement to you this week is last. Ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart, show you any areas of your life that are not open for him? Well, as we're getting ready to go, I want to close with prayer. Uh, today's scripture about prayer is Romans 8, 26 and 27. Uh, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So, uh, you know, as I said last week, all of us have a need, every single one of us here. And we just have to make sure, uh, do we walk out the door with that need in our pocket, or do we maybe stand or ask for prayer? So, if you have a need today, just kind of stand up, raise your hand, whatever. Uh, go to someone next to you and say, pray for me before I go. But feel free, everyone else, when we're done, we're done. So, But if you have a need, stay and ask for prayer. So, Lord, we lift up your name, Lord. 
Father, we ask your spirit to just uh, overwhelm this place. We speak the name of Jesus, Lord. We speak it loud and clear, Lord, and we uh, claim it over this place. We claim it over our hearts. And we thank you for the opportunity to be here in Jesus' name. Amen.